So in my previous video I've talked about the acetals and their formation. If you haven't seen that one yet, pause this video now and go watch that one first. In this video, we are going to talk about the reverse process, the acetal hydrolysis. As I've mentioned in my previous video, acetal formation is a reversible equilibrium process. We make acetals by reacting a corresponding carbonyl with an alcohol or a diol, like what I have in this case, which gives us the acetal and water as a co-product. However, if we take an acetal and react that with excess of water, we are going to go back to our carbonyl and the corresponding alcohol. And since this reaction is an equilibrium, we are going to have all the same intermediates in the acetal hydrolysis as in the acetal formation. I'll remind you here that this reaction requires the acidic catalyst. So we'll have some sort of an acid here to serve as our source of proton in our system. Typically, we are going to see either sulfuric or tazelic acid, but those are of course not the only options that you might see in your course or on the test. So keep your eyes spilled so you don't confuse the acid catalyst with a different reagent. Now, mechanistically speaking, the acetal hydrolysis is a combination of all the same proton transfer steps, nucleophilic attacks and living group dissociations, just like the acetal formation, but in reverse. So what we're going to see, we will first start with the proton transfer. That proton transfer serves to protonate one of our oxygens and convert that group into a living group. Which of the oxygens you're going to attack first really doesn't matter. We can grab this one or we can just as easily grab that one. As a result, we are going to get a protonated species and now this part of our molecule is going to be the living group which is going to pop off, making the corresponding CO double bond which kind of resembles the carbonyl. Now, in this case we have two potential nucleophiles. We have our alcohol that just popped off or we have water. And I will remind you that we are using water in excess here. So statistically speaking, it is this water that's going to be doing the nucleophilic attack and not the alcohol going back and reattacking this carbonyl-like compound. So once my water attacks, we're going to end up with another protonated intermediate, which we're going to deprotonate with another equivalent of water, like so, giving us a neutral intermediate over here. Well, this neutral intermediate, we already know what that is. We have the OR group and we have the OH group, so that is our hemiacetal. And just like in the case of the acetal formation, the hemiacetal is a midpoint product, in the case of the acetal hydrolysis, same deal. Hemiacetal is just the midpoint, so we are going to reprotonate that again, now we are going to make another OR group as our uh, living group, that gives, well, the living group, which going to dissociate, giving us the protonated final product and after the last step where water is going to come in and pull that proton off, we are going to end up with our final product and aldehyde in this case. So we took our initial acetal over here and in the course of this reaction we ended up with the aldehyde with our carbonyl and two equivalents of an alcohol, each of which dropped off at a different time during our overall mechanism. Now, from the perspective of the pattern, it's going to be very similar to the acetal formation, but in reverse again. So we are going to start with a proton transfer, then we had the leaving group dissociation, followed by the nucleophilic attack by water, then we had a couple of proton transfers, we had the living group dissociation where the second alcohol popped off, and finally we had the final proton transfer giving us the final product. So this pattern is definitely something that you want to memorize, because if you know that, you'll be able to get any kind of acetal hydrolysis with ease. Now, of course, we know that acetals can be open chain, like in the case of the previous example, or they can be cyclic, and of course we can hydrolyze the cyclic acetal as well well. The pattern and the steps here are going to be just the same. We are going to start with the proton transfer, giving us the corresponding protonated intermediate, which then going to have the living group dissociating, but here big difference that we are going to see. The living group that we had over here 
which going to make the corresponding alcohol is still a part of the initial molecule. So don't just rip it off the molecule and have it floating by itself. It is still hanging by one of the ends. Now, after that, we are going to have water coming in and attacking our carbonyl-like compound again, giving us the corresponding protonated intermediate, then we are going to have a couple of proton transfers, I'm doing a shortcut here and putting both of the steps under the same arrow, and then we are going to have our leaving group dissociation, and at that point this entire group, this entire diol pops off, giving us our alcohol co-product. And finally, we are going to have the last proton transfer to get rid of that extra proton sitting on our carbonyl and giving us the final product, which in this case is going to be a ketone. So as I said, exactly the same pattern, exactly the same steps, with the only difference is that you are not going to be leaving your entire living group off the molecule immediately, it's going to stepwise fall off first one side, then the other side, and then eventually instead of two equivalents of an alcohol, we are going to end up with one equivalent of the corresponding diol. And just like in my last video on the acetyl hydrolysis, I am only showing one directional arrow instead of the equilibrium arrows on each of my steps. I want to drive the point that the reaction goes in whatever direction we choose choose based on the Le Chatelier principle and its application. Of course, if your instructor is very particular about using the equilibrium arrows, you'll have to use the equilibrium arrows in class and draw all of your mechanisms with the equilibrium arrows. So technically on each of my steps I should be drawing these equilibrium arrows going in both directions for each and every of my steps like this and so on. Now, knowing mechanism is of course is really cool, but we are not going to have the luxury of all all the time in the universe when we are on the exam. We are going to be pressed on time, which means that we are going to have to rely a little bit on the visualization trick here. Conveniently enough for us, just like in the case of the acetal formation, there is a very simple trick that we can use here to easily predict the product of the acetal hydrolysis. So let's say we are starting with the acetal that looks like this, and we are doing the hydrolysis, which means that we have water and some sort of acid catalyst present. Now, in order to quickly predict my product, of course I don't want to draw the entire mechanism here. But what I'm going to do here, I'm going to redraw my starting material, so by tracing all the bonds and everything very carefully here, and just redrawing it exactly as is, so here we are. Then I'm going to grab my eraser and I'm going to get rid of the bonds between my oxygen and the carbon. At that point, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to add the carbonyl to where my bonds used to be, and I'm also going to add the hydrogen to each of my oxygens so they don't sit by themselves. And there we have our products. Now, if I redraw it a little bit better instead of those ridiculously small uh, things that I had to add there, what I'm going to have is cyclohexanone that I have like this with my CO double bond, then I have one equivalent of my alcohol, and I have the second equivalent of my alcohol, or we could potentially just draw one of these guys and just say two equivalents of that. And of course, this trick works for the cyclic acetals as well. Let's say we have a cyclic acetal like this, and we are doing the hydrolysis reaction again. So step number one, I'm going to carefully redraw my molecule just as I see it, showing all the bonds, especially the bonds with my oxygen, making sure that I am not losing anything. Then I'm going to grab my eraser, get rid of the bond with an oxygen on both sides, then I'm going to add the carbonyl to where my CO bonds used to be, and give a hydrogen to each of my oxygens, like so. And just like in the previous case, if I redraw my molecules nicely, these are my products. You can always confirm that by drawing the entire mechanism and making sure for yourself that you can see how I got that through the mechanism and then through the trick. Always use the trick first uh, to quickly predict your products, but don't forget to confirm your products with the mechanism, especially if you have time and while you are practicing, like when you are doing your homework or when you are just practicing your questions. 
you need to make sure that you got the mechanism down to the point where you can draw it basically with your eyes closed in the middle of the night. This mechanism, as I've mentioned, is just as classic as the acetal formation, so you do want to know that very well. But overall, as you can see, predicting the products in the acetal hydrolysis is just as easy as in the acetal formation. So do plenty of practice to make sure that you can do it quickly and correctly and you'll be all set. Easy peasy. And talking of practice, in the next video I'll go over a few more examples of the acetal formation and hydrolysis. So boop the like button and subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates if you haven't done so yet. Have yourself an awesome day and I will see you tomorrow.